In this lecture, we will be discussing short bowel syndrome, also known as SBS. Short bowel syndrome refers to a series of symptoms related to short, small intestine. The name short bowel syndrome, therefore, is very descriptive. Individuals end up with a small intestine that is too short as a result of a larger section of the small intestine. On average for adults, the small intestine is six to seven meters or 23 feet long, which is a very generous length. So there is a surplus in terms of functional surface area. Therefore, unless we lose a significant portion of the small intestine, the remaining small intestine should be adequate to keep up with the necessary functions. However, when the section removed is too large, then the remaining section can no longer keep up. So knowing this, we can say the etiology of SBS is due to the excessive loss of surface area caused by the surgical resection of a large portion of the small intestine. When we lose that much length, we are losing a lot of surface area. And as a consequence, we will have male digestion and malabsorption. There are many factors that can lead to the larger section of portions of the small intestine. These can be found in both children and adults. It could be trauma, which we see is valid for both of these populations. It could be cancer or Crohn's disease, which we discussed that this could be the reason for people to lose part of the small intestine as well. If we remember, Crohn's disease can affect any por portion of the GI tract, so it is not limited to the colon. Also, for people who undergo radiation to kill cancer cells, our intestinal tissue is very sensitive to the radiation, and sometimes certain sections of the intestine are killed as well uh, along with the cancer cells as collateral damage. Therefore, we need to surgically remove the dead tissue. So this slide here lists very common etiologies for children and adults who may have short bowel syndrome. There are consequences in a clinical setting when people do not have when people do have short bowel syndrome and no longer have a small intestine that is six to seven meters long wrapped around in the abdominal cavity. When the jejunal resection is about half, 50 to 60%, patients can usually still tolerate it well. This means that the patient can still have a relatively normal digestion and absorption. And then if we have the ileal resection, and if we lose more than 30% of the ileum, then this is poorly tolerated. Also, when what is left, the residual small bowel, if it is less than 100 millimeters, then we will see people having severe malnutrition. If we think about the normal length of the adult small intestine, the full length is about seven meters as we mentioned. But if the residual small bowel is less than 10 centimeters, that is a very tiny portion of this. It's about one and a half percent of the full length. So it makes sense that we would see severe malabsorption here. The deficiencies caused by SBS, in addition to the nutrients, we worry about um, also fluid and electrolytes. We know that the small intestine is the major site of absorption for the majority of nutrients as well as water. 
then severe fluid and electrolyte loss is often associated with angiogenostomy. Here we have surgery done on the jejunal section and there is an opening created there, potent potentially causing the loss of a lot of fluids and electrolytes before they can be absorbed. In terms of micronutrient deficiencies, magnesium, calcium, and zinc deficiencies are common. The prognosis of short bowel syndrome depends on the length of the, of the remaining small bowel. Again, here we are looking at how much is left. So on the previous slide, um, we saw the percentage for the jejunum loss that could be tolerated, and for the ileum, how much is not well tolerated. Also, the, the health of the remaining GI tract is important. Is what is left fully functional, or does it also have a compromised condition? In addition, any comorbidities, um, would have an effect as well. We already mentioned that because the small bowel is the site for digestion and absorption, major vitamin and mineral losses can be expected. Fat malabsorption is also not uncommon. And when this occurs, we should also check the status of the fat-soluble vitamins. Also, minerals, including electrolytes, are at high risk to become deficient as well. After intestinal surgery, usually the recovery of the patient can be divided into three phases. The first phase is about seven to, day, seven to 10 days post-op. Patients during this phase suffer from extensive fluid and electrolyte loss and some of them may have a large volume of diarrhea. Here we are having the malfunction of the intestine. Therefore, it is very common that patients will receive parenteral nutrition. The second phase is months after surgery. So beyond the first phase, it may last a few months. In this phase, the patient's diarrhea is getting better and the remaining bowel is going through adaptations. Patients are also using tube feeding and trying to wean off tube feeding and transition into the usual um, PO diets. The third phase can be one to two years post-op. In this phase, the remaining bowel is continuing to adapt and the small bowel is actually growing in both length and diameter, and the height of the villi can also increase. So all of this here can contribute to an increase in surface area. And when surface area in the remaining sections of the small bowel is increasing, then we can expect that the maldigestion and malabsorption that was experienced earlier should be resolved at least partially. The reason that they had these issues was due to the decreased surface area. Therefore, with increased surface area, things can be getting better. There is evidence that supports early enteral nutrition because it supports the successful adaptation of the small bowel. Again, as long as the patient can tolerate it, we need to supply enteral nutrition as early as we can to stimulate the small intestine. To treat small bowel symptom syndrome, we need to pay close attention and manage fluid and electrolyte balance. We mentioned in a previous topic for diarrhea um, that oral rehydration solution is also helpful to reestablish the balance of both fluids and electrolytes. We can also refer patients back to the physician to adjust medications for intestinal motility and address diarrhea and gastric hypersecretion. For nutrition assessment, in addition to the usual, 
we want to focus on the fluid and beverage intake. We also need to pay special attention to the patient's surgical history because if we can find out the reason for the patient having the surgery and also the specifics of the surgery, as in which parts of the small intestine and how much of it was removed, then it would be easier for us to assess the risks as different parts of the small intestine have different roles. For example, the ileum, which is the distal end section of the small intestine, it is responsible for vitamin B12 absorption because the receptor for intrinsic factor are located on the cells in the ileum. Therefore, if a, major, if a majority of the ileum is removed, then we can predict that the patient will probably not have good absorption for oral or enterally provided vitamin B12. So therefore, we would want to recommend vitamin B12 shots to begin with. So thus, digging out the details of surgical history is very important. Problems for nutrition diagnosis usually are in the intake domain with the inadequate intake. And there would be unintentional weight loss due to maldigestion and malabsorption. For sure, we would have altered GI function if a significant portion of the small intestine is gone. And also, we would see impaired nutrient utilization as we may not have, uh, as we may have adequate intake, but we're not able to absorb adequately, so the bioavailability of the nutrients are affected. Nutrition intervention depends on which phase we are talking about. Immediately post-op, we will be using the parenteral nutrition support. As diarrhea decreases and the patient goes through the different phases post-op, then we can initiate an oral diet and advance is tolerated. The progression of the diet should be relatively slow and we should be providing low residue, low fat, lactose-free, and low oxalate diet. So this is similar to what we saw in some of the other condi conditions we discussed involving the intestine. Patients should also avoid caffeine, alcohol, sugar alcohols, as well as insoluble fiber. All of these could lead to diarrhea and other symptoms causing more discomfort. So here are some general guidelines for short bowel syndrome. If we are talking about patients with colonic segment, we want to prescribe a low fat, high carbohydrate diet. For those patients that have had a jejunostomy or shorter ileostomies, then we would want a higher fat, lower carb diet. As always, patients should chew well and avoid concentrated sweets and foods since this could change the osmotic pressure in the intestine. Also, they should have smaller, more frequent meals and try to limit fluids with meals. So basically separate them with solid food first and then allowing some time to pass and having the liquid later. If we remember, this recommendation is similar to those um, for those who had those patients who have had bariatric surgeries. In those cases, we are bypassing certain sections of the GI tract. Therefore, the consequences are very similar to what we are discussing now in short bowel syndrome. So it would make sense that the recommendations would be similar as well. The next two slides summarize specific recommendations in terms of food groups and beverages that are good choices and which of these to avoid. Please study these on your own.